In the past 18 months, since the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war, the threat of a possible nuclear war is mentioned in the media almost every day. There are nine countries in the world who reportedly have nuclear weapons, over 13,000 in all, of which 89% are controlled by the United States and Russia. Rebecca Heinrichs of the Hudson Institute spends most of her professional time thinking, speaking, and writing about international issues. We ask her to give us her analysis of the nuclear weapons issue. Rebecca Heinrichs, if you were President of the United States and you're sitting in the Oval Office, what does our nuclear capability look like from your standpoint? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me here today. So I would say that uh, America's nuclear uh, deterrent is sound. It is uh, comprised of a triad of delivery systems. And I think we'll get into that a little bit about what, what I mean by that. But it is also, um, it's old. <laughs> We've A lot of our delivery systems have been around for decades. And we are in the beginning of a major recapitalization uh, in order to make sure that the United States' strategy for deterrence uh, holds. And as the threats to the United States continue to change, um, become more complex, more challenging, U.S. nuclear deterrence um, uh, strategy, the strategy remains the same, but we have to adapt it uh, based on the, the, the changes. And so that is where I believe that the United States needs to needs to improve upon, making sure that we're able to successfully, credibly deter both China and Russia, um, which of course is what's new and different um, than, than what we dealt with during the Cold War. So again, you're sitting in the old office. How much do you think the president knows about what would happen if all of a sudden somebody rushes in the office and says, there's a nuke headed our way? I, I, I think that that's an area where the United States um, probably needs to improve upon since the Cold War. Um, we were better at thinking about this and had better practice of thinking about that um, during the Cold War. And I think the President of the United States now um, is is really um, probably has thought more about this particular challenge because of Russia's threats against NATO um, during its invasion of Ukraine. Um, but but I think that this is a major area uh, of improvement that that we need to make as a country to make sure the commander in chief is more um, adequately ready and prepared to to handle the, the potential nuclear challenges that we have. But what again? You're in the Oval Office. What happens? If somebody comes in, your military aide or your chief of staff, and says there's a nuke coming our way, what would we do? Do you think? What would he do? So it would depend on what it. De it would depend. It would depend on where the nuclear weapon was coming from. It would depend on where it was headed. Um, it would depend on the number of nuclear weapons that were headed into the United States. Um, now, let's, for instance, paint a picture, and this is all um, hypothetical scenario, but let's say it was a, a it was a, just a, a, a smaller number of nuclear weapons coming from North Korea. The United States has a missile defense system uh, designed specifically to protect the U.S. homeland against North Korean missiles. So we would seek to intercept it. Um, we would also seek to make um, particular, you know, protections of anything that, that we were able to protect or move if we believe they were at risk, depending on where it was headed. We have a system of sensors that could track it and see where it was headed. The challenge becomes much more difficult if it was a nuclear attack from, say, a Russia or a China. The United States does not have um, a missile defense system designed to handle those kinds of, of attack. So uh, I read somewhere read that if you're in Maine, you're pretty safe. If you're in Montana or Washington, D.C. and a bunch of other places, that bomb is coming your way. No way to stop it if it comes out of an ICBM from Russia. Well, we would certainly um, we would certainly shoot at it. Uh, so our missile defense system is designed against the rogue state actor, the North Korea. Um, that doesn't mean that it couldn't have some kind of attempt or some kind of ability against if it was a single threat headed from from Russia. But again, it's not scoped. It's not designed to handle the kinds of threats. So we've heard a lot from General Van Herc. He's the commander of Northern Command. 
about the various vulnerabilities we have from cruise missiles from Russia, et cetera. So um, there are there are different kinds of vulnerabilities depending on where you are and the the kind of threat coming from a peer threat. You think of like a Russia or a China. Um, but again, you know, this is why it's so important that we shore up one our defenses, which is what I think you know, that sort of what we're talking about here, but also the credibility of our deterrence so that our adversaries are always convinced that that would not be a wise way to go, that we would thwart their attempts or that we would retaliate in such a way that they would deem that it's not worth it to attack the U.S. homeland. And that's where deterrence comes into play and is so important. What's your reaction when you hear almost every day somebody talking about the possibility of a nuclear war? Um, well, you know, I I have been concerned that, again, we've sort of gotten out of practice thinking about deterrence. And so on the one hand, you know, I, I, I share Americans' concern about the possibility of, of nuclear employment, especially as the United States seeks to arm Ukraine um, to defend itself against Russia while Russia is threatening and using very, very provocative language about nuclear um, use against NATO. Um, I'm, I understand Americans' fear, but I get frustrated that the U.S. leadership isn't um, turning their attention to making the Russians fear, frankly. It's not the Americans who should be so, so fearful. It should be the Russians who are fearful about U.S. and ally response if they were, were to do something so foolish as to cross the nuclear threshold. Because again, that's I understand Americans' concern and fear. I think a lot of the um, the rhetoric and under uh, surrounding the issue on um, major uh, media outlets, et cetera, is unhelpful and unproductive and exposes a lack of understanding about what the United States needs to do in order to make sure that we maintain the nuclear peace and keep Americans safe. I'm going to go down this list very quickly. I know you know this, and I want you to explain why only these nine countries supposedly have a nuclear weapon. Russia, United States, China. France, United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel, North Korea. Why only nine? Um, it's a really good question. And a lot of this has to do with the success of America's uh, extended nuclear assurances that we provide allies. So the United States extends a nuclear umbrella to ally countries in NATO and also to Japan and South Korea. So countries that are certainly at risk of, of attack from autocratic nations that have imperialistic designs, Russia and China right now, they're the ones that we're looking at, um, North Korea still um, threatening South Korea and Japan. Um, but these countries uh, are reliant on American extended nuclear deterrence. And, and so they've chosen not to have their own uh, domestic nuclear capability. And that's another reason why U.S. nuclear weapons are so important. We, the primary purpose is to keep Americans safe and to provide a credible deterrence against our adversaries. But the second one is to provide credible assurances to so many of our allies who have chosen to rely on our extended deterrence. So that's that's the really big reason why you don't see so many other countries that would be at risk um, not have their own domestic capabilities. Why did South Africa give them up nuclear weapons? <laughs> It's a complex question, um, and and a lot of people kind of look to that as a um, as sort of the case study that can be done, especially when you look at a country that has just a smaller number of nuclear weapons, but is a very dangerous country like North Korea. And fundamentally, it comes down to um, a regime has to be convinced that the alternative is better for their own security, and and so that's that's the that's the simple answer. Um, but it's very, very difficult to achieve once an ad, especially a dangerous country like a North Korea, who doesn't have the wealth to create uh, a massive military. Um, they they can have they can pour their resources into a smaller number of just nuclear weapons to frankly to coerce a much more powerful, stronger country like the United States and to guarantee to in their minds their own security. You talked about the triad, the nuclear triad. The big airplanes, the subs, and the ground-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. We have 14 nuclear subs. 
nuclear weapons on subs, 14 different subs. The um, Ohio class, what do you think of that? What does that mean to the average person? What is it, why do we have all that? So the way we think about it again, um, and I was explaining it to, to just your um, average working American, minding their own business and trying to live their life, that we have this triad of nuclear weapons, triad of delivery systems, um, that analysts, strategists have concluded every time we've looked at this and studied this again and again, that this is the soundest way, that the best way that we that we can, to the extent that we can know, maintain credible deterrence. So when I say credible deterrence, what I mean is you as an American in Indiana or Ohio might think we only need X number of nuclear weapons that you think would be necessary to provide security for the American people. But it really doesn't matter. What, what matters is what we believe our adversaries will conclude is necessary to prevent them from acting in a way that goes against U.S. security interests. And so we have a triad of delivery systems. Triad meaning each kind of delivery system provides something unique to, uh, to our national authorities. That would be the, the president, essentially, and, and his advisors. Nuclear submarines um, provide certain characteristics. They're stealthy, obviously. They're very survivable. They're hard to find, almost impossible to find. They give the United States great global reach. Then you have our ICBMs, our continental ballistic missiles. That provides a very prompt response. They're distributed across five states in the United States. There's 400 silos with um, ICBMs. And that, uh, really what that does is it's our ultimate guarantee to, if, if an adversary is gonna hit our ICBMs, that means they're really gonna go, you know, go for it and hit the, the price of entry is very high. That means they're gonna have to hit the United States homeland to take out those ICBMs. And they're very prompt and responsive for the president. And then you have your bombers, that's your air leg. And that provides the most uh, flexible leg of the triad. We can call them out, we can signal to our allies, we're here, and they can be confident, we can bring them back. Um, and then as we add um, new kinds of delivery, um, uh, uh, different cruise missiles, et cetera, on those that provides even longer range strike ability to actually penetrate air defenses that our adversaries might have. And so that's what the bomber leg provides. All, all three of these delivery systems comprise our nuclear triad. And we believe that this is what um, provides security to the greatest degree. Why would you need any more than those 14 submarines if you can't find them? I know they're not all out at sea at the same time. What, why would you, I mean, I know there's a schedule that you're gonna have a Ohio class now and I want you to tell me what that means. And then in 2029, supposedly a Columbia class, what does that mean? So the United States is constantly trying to look at what our adversaries are developing, what technologies they have to make sure that we are still able to put weapons on targets. So we wanna be able to make sure that we can successfully be confident that, in, confident ourselves and making sure that our adversaries are confident that we have the best technology that's able to actually ensure that the United States can put weapons on targets if we need to, and that's how we maintain the credibility of our deterrence. And so these weapon systems are old. And so we are, we're, we're replacing our current fleet of submarines with new ones by 2029. And that's because of many things that the Department of Defense knows about our adversaries advancing in certain ways. And so we need to advance as well. And the new submarines will, will be able to have uh, 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 new capabilities and different kinds of capabilities to ensure that they will be the submarines that we'll have for many, many years after they come online and replace Ohio. Now, to your original question, I, I think about why, why would we need more than submarines? And I, I think what you mean is why do we need the other legs of the triad? No, no. You know, why uh, isn't... Yeah, why... Well, yes. I mean, the, you said that they're undetectable when they're out at sea and you could destroy... I mean, what do they have? 20 different missiles on there. How many different independently retargeted targeting uh, missiles or, or bombs are on each of those Trident submarines? Trident, uh, well, I, I don't know all the specific details about subs. You have to talk to a uh, submarine expert on that. But I can tell you from a strategist perspective or somebody who studies deterrence and why we do it this way is because those characteristics and attributes that the ICBMs provide visible, they're there, they're in the US homeland, they're distributed. And so they they provide a certain degree of, um, of uh, 
complication to our adversary that these submarines that you don't see unless they pop up every now and again to give you a peek as to where they are or they're doing a, a visit somewhere else in the world just to signal again to our allies to, so that they're confident but also to our adversaries that we can still go undetected until we want to be seen. But that, but the ICBMs provide a different, an entirely different set of problems for our adversary in addition to what our submarines provide. Our bombers are something that I'm very excited about um, in dealing with the, the challenges we have today with a, both with a Russia, which is a very serious nuclear challenge and threat, but then also China, um, which is becoming more uh, bolder in its military provocations and threats, its imperialistic aims, and then also um, it's growing its own nuclear program. Um, and we, we are public reporting indicates that that they could have they could continue to, to increase and in fact double the number of nuclear warheads that they have. And they have around 400, I believe, is the latest public reporting and could continue to grow that. And so you also need to have this 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 bomber leg that can signal resolve and ha and is recallable. And, and can also demonstrate that we can get through the air defenses and put weapons on targets. Again, for deterrence, the thing that I, that's very difficult, I think that, that almost seems counterintuitive to the layperson, to the American, is that we're trying to constantly create complications for our adversary. And so they have to look at the spectrum of contingencies and that they always conclude that whatever kind of nuclear employment they might be considering, we have a proportional response for that that is credible and therefore they should not seek to go down that path because they would not succeed that's why we need the number that we have and the different kinds of delivery systems that we have how far do you think we can go with all this we we're spending close to a trillion dollars it's only i think it's 850 uh, billion but close to a trillion dollars on defense in this next year's budget and if you look at the future and the planning for instance the B-21, which is supposed to replace the B-52 as a delivery vehicle, so far the first couple have cost $700 million to produce. And they're going to do 100 of those at least. And how, how far can we go in spending this kind of money? The Gerald R. Ford carrier that's out there is $13 billion, if we really know the figure. We always find out later that it's a lot more. How many, we're going to build one of those every five years. How much can this country afford when it comes to this kind of uh, uh, weaponry? Well, the, the, the first point I, I, I always try to acknowledge as somebody who um, understands that in a democracy, you have to convince the American people that they are the ones that are deciding. And so I think it's actually a very, very good question. And the American people always deserve a sound and serious answer on this particular point. And um, none of it is cheap. But I would argue that all of it is eminently affordable, eminently affordable, and in fact necessary that we invest in this particular way. If you look at it as a percentage of the overall military budget, it's actually a very, very small uh, percentage. I think the number at its peak of recapitalization, I think it's around six and a half percent of our military budget. And then our entire military budget, last time I checked, four percent of GDP. And if you think about the rising of mandatory spending, um, it, 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 it's, it's actually small and going down relative to, to mandatory spending that, that we look at as in terms of a larger uh, piece of the pie of what this country spends and the federal government spends. And so it's good to have some perspective and context. Um, but then I would I always try to emphasize that um, the the whole objective for deterrence is that you actually don't you don't want, you know, deterrence is one of those things that you you don't really hear much about it and then you really miss it and think that, you know, wish we would have invested in it more if it does ever fail. This is what is buying us peace. And it undergirds everything that we do in, um, in, in national defense. And so when we think about the United States sailing in international waters and having the confidence to do that, providing aid to Ukraine, um, providing in, uh, training in Poland, et cetera, um, taking out ISIS in the Middle East, all of these conventional, meaning non-nuclear, sort of lower level uh, uh, behaviors that, that we're conducting and engaged in, they're all quietly but confidently relying on nuclear deterrence holding. That we're confident that nuclear deterrence holds so that we can maneuver in this conventional space for America's security benefits. And so that's how I would answer that question. Um, but, but truly the numbers are high and I don't ever um, uh, disagree with that but relative to what they provide and in larger contents about what this country spends on other things, it's actually 
um, a good bargain for the American taxpayer. But as we sit here in Washington, D.C. and look at China and look at Russia, the leaders of both of those countries are, in effect, dictators. And they have to answer to the proletariat. I mean, not the proletariat, the, the parliament or the, you know, their, their uh, infrastructure. We here have this complicated process of having to get everything approved by the Congress. The president doesn't have that kind of power. Are we, are we going to be in trouble with this? Because Putin just says, drop the bombs on Ukraine. He doesn't have to, ha have to ask anybody. I'm actually heartened that um, that there actually is bipartisan consensus on the um, on the belief and the con and the the understanding that nuclear deterrence must hold. And so, of all of the different things of which the the U.S. Congress is divided on, very polarized in many ways, on this particular issue, thankfully, um, they're they're the leadership, both in the Republican Democratic Party. You get into those briefings and you see how bad the threats are. And then you understand from the military about how it is that we're seeking to deter the worst kinds of violence. There has been bipartisan consensus. Um, what, what I am very focused on at this point, though, is that that bipartisan consensus holds, that we don't ever lose sight that this is what has actually maintained the nuclear peace since uh, the Second World War and through the Cold War, and that it's just necessary that we are always looking to make sure that we're doing what we can to maintain the credibility of those deterrents, which means recapitalization and adapting the, the deterrent as we need, as our adversaries continue to move in different ways and threaten us in different ways. How have we been able to fly B-52s since 50, 60 years? And, and I know you're, you're saying that we're, we're behind on this and replacing some of this stuff. Uh, what's your sense of that? That's, that's the delivery by air of uh, nuclear weapons. So it's always a, it's a nuanced answer. It's on the one hand, it is amazing that our weapon systems are still as capable as they are, as old as they are. And that's a, that's a great testament to the, to the work product of the American people years and years and years, decades ago. Um, but but they are reaching to the point where they're they're decades beyond what they were even designed um, for their lifespan for how long they were supposed to live. And so uh, we're to the point where, again, we're looking at advanced technologies that our adversaries have, the complexity of the threat environment. So new adversaries popping up on the scene in new ways and their their own military strategies becoming a little bit different dynamic. And so the United States has to seek to deter, especially what I'm really concerned is that not a massive attack against the U.S. homeland, but these uh, lower yield theater uh, employment of nuclear weapons that Russia or potentially China, if they move in on Taiwan, might think they can get away with in order to scare the United States and our allies from intervening conventionally. And so that's where we have to adapt. That's where we have to make sure, look, can we produce the warheads we need at the numbers that we need? We, we've, we have not invested in our nuclear enterprise and our ability to produce warheads. Do, and do these delivery systems, are, they, are we confident that they are still going to perform when they need to and get around the air defenses that our adversaries have been advancing over the last several years? That's why we have to continually invest in um, our capabilities to make sure that they are the modern nuclear deterrent force that we need for the threat environment. Let, let me divert for a minute and ask you about uh, what you do and why you do it. When did you... Where'd you grow up? So I um, I love to talk about where I grew up. I grew up in a small town in Ohio. Uh, it's a farming town, um, small little town with two stoplights, and called Fredericktown, Ohio, in Knox County. And um, I was a the the sort of short answer is I was a freshman in college at Ashland University, it's a little art school there in Ashland, Ohio. I was a freshman when 9/11 happened. And um, just as I was becoming very, very interested in political philosophy, the meaning of America, what makes us different, you know, we were hit by the Al Qaeda on 9-11. And so my interest became in um, security. But then as I was studying security, um, the, 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 I had this realization that the global war on terror, terror um, as difficult and hard and real and threatening as terrorists um, the terrorist threat is to the American people, that we still very much have the potential of, of another major uh, war that um, I thankfully have never lived through. I was born during at the end of the Cold War. 
And so we need serious people, next generation of people looking to make sure that we know how to do this, that, that we don't simply forget or naively assume that the United States of America will not once again be faced with a peer power with nuclear weapons. And so that's whenever I began studying nuclear deterrence in a much more serious way. Why does, I mean, what is it about it that, that uh, gets your interest in, and how do you, how do you go about learning all this in order to participate in the discussion? Well, um, for me, you know, uh, again, you sort you sort of begin. You don't you don't know what you don't know, and then the more you the more you read, and especially as you study the Cold War, you realize that, um, you know, what is it that has made the United States so safe and powerful? And when we talk about the U.S. led order, when we talk about the rules based order, which is really a euphemism, I think, for the U.S. led order. We're talking about um the 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 global environment in which the united states has been the preeminent power what is the source of our of our preeminence and that is our our military and our economic heft and of course it's the strength of our ideas i think that's what makes us the the most just and benevolent um global power that that we have seen but it really is it's the it's our military might and power backed by a strong economy and most fundamentally it is america's nuclear deterrent and so if deterrence does not hold, then we will not live in a world in which the United States is the preeminent global power. We might live in a world under serious nuclear coercion in which the United States can't move in the world on terms that are that serve the interests of the American people. And so um, to me, that 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 it all boils down to if you if you want to live in a world that that I have enjoyed and grew up in and my child, I want my children to grow up in, then the United States must must remain the preeminent eminent power. So how do I go about um, studying this? Uh, well, uh, there's lots of uh, current literature. People are kind of taking bites at the apple and thinking about what Russia is doing, what 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 China is doing. Um, but then also really it's a return to, cold, to the Cold War texts and books. Congressional testimony is is just full of treasures about how we were thinking about this. A lot of those tenants hold today. It's just that we have different threat challenges. Um, and then I, I teach courses at the Institute of World Politics on nuclear strategy. And then I'm also in the course um, getting pursuing my doctorate of defense and strategic studies at Missouri State um, under the, the, the guidance of Dr. Keith Payne, who is one of the, the country's preeminent um, theorists about deterrence and practitioners. And so it really is just a lot of it's just a lot of reading contemporary scholarship and then also from, you know, scholarship and thinking from the greatest strategists from the Cold War era. You say sometimes when you speak to groups that people are often more interested in the fact that you have five children than uh, <laughs> the subject matter we're talking about. And I guess it's a fair question is how have you been able to have five children in the middle of this, you know, your own career and, and your time at Hudson and your doctor degree and all that stuff? Well, um, I don't do it all at once with the same degree of energy. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I still believe that, again, with all the challenges that the country faces, that we still have enormous opportunity for uh, for Americans to work hard and also have the lives that that they want to have um, to the extent that they can control some of these variables, some of them are beyond our ability to control them. And and I made it pretty clear um, that you know I I I wanted to have a, a family and I wanted to pour into a family. And so when we um, got married and began having children, I I didn't do as much of my um, public efforts uh on professionally as i was growing our family and so we sequenced them so really focused on that and then as the children got older i continued reading throughout continued my research um continued to make sure that i knew what was going on in current events and to the extent that i had the ability and the bandwidth to to be able to to write and think and analyze and put forward scholarship then i did and then when there were other opportunities that were not conducive to being at home with small children, you know, I didn't. And I just trusted that um, that that making those decisions and prioritizing those 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 things that were most important to me, that that it would that it would work out OK. And it and it has. Um, so here we are. Uh, my oldest child is turning 14 tomorrow. 
um, and um, and then we'll be wrapping up hopefully my doctorate in the spring. And, um, and with it, hopefully, um, a, a published book that, um, that uh, really is the capstone of my doctoral program. And so here we are. What's the subject of your dissertation? So it's about how the just war doctrine um, has been and remains compatible with US deterrence strategy. During the Cold War, there's always these peace movements. So you have your pacifists that are sort of pacifists in general, but then you have just your nuclear pacifists who, who, who can't seem to get it, get, you know, make, make sense from a moral perspective, the potential employment of a nuclear weapons, even in, in defense of something good, or even for deterrence purposes. And that was a very robust debate that the country had during the Cold War, um, the Catholic bishops came out with a statement on what they thought was acceptable or not acceptable based on just war principles. Well, here we are, and we now have two nuclear challenges and then rogue state nuclear challenges and then whatever is on the horizon that we don't even know about yet. And I think it deserves, the American people deserve to know, do we, do we use our nuclear weapons and think about nuclear weapons in a way that, that makes sense with how we think about morality and war? And I believe that the answer has been yes. And so I explain that in my in my doctoral capstone. Um, to, to, so I, with with really the average American in mind, so they can be confident that yes, the United States. It's it's actually counter to it's disarmament. Actually, runs the risk of running afoul of just war doctrine. Um, and so that's that's the argument that I make in my in my thesis. You mentioned that China has something around four hundred nuclear weapons, some configuration of a nuclear weapon. And again, I, I'm just going to read it quickly. And these numbers may be off, just correct them as after we finish. But Russia has 58, 5,889, United States 5,224, France 290, UK 225, Pakistan 170, India 164, Israel 90, North Korea 30. What is that? Why is this great? Where, why the great imbalance? And why are we not threatened by India or Pakistan or, you know, I mean, we're not obviously at the moment, we're not threatened by France or, or UK. So this gets back, this gets to really important questions about international relations. And, um, and there's different competing schools of thought about how the United States thinks about our, our national defense strategy. Um, I, I just transparently belonged. I mean, I'm a, I would consider myself I'm a realist, um, and so uh, um, I, I believe in certain sort of anthropological assumptions about people and regimes. And one of those is that uh, countries are going to act in their own interests, whatever they perceive them to be, and they're not always what we think that they should be for other countries. But the nature of the regime and their national ambition determines to the extent that they that they are a threat to ours. And so the nature of our country and our national ambitions um, don't conflict with that of, of our allies. And so those those countries don't don't concern us. I don't lose sleep over France's nuclear weapons, though I wish that they were less prickly when it comes to cooperating within the NATO context. Um, where and I, but I do, I I do get very concerned about Russia's and China's in particular. India, Pakistan, obviously, um, is concerning. Not that they would shoot them at us um, um, today in this contem contemporary threat environment, but that they could have a conflict between one another that could escalate beyond the conventional to nuclear. And so we're, we keep an eye on that, and, and we're we're, you know, we as the United States are concerned about that. But but we. The, the, so why the imbalance? So countries are going to um, get the kinds of capabilities that they believe are necessary given their national aims. Um, and, and right now, the, the, the major challenge has been preventing a war between the United States and the then Soviet Union, which then became the Russian Federation. And so the, the, the stockpiles are designed given that particular dynamic. The numbers that you cite, it's important for for Americans to keep in mind those numbers that are that go above 5,000 for each of our arsenals, ours in the Russian Federation. It's actually more nuanced than that because Russia's nuclear weapons are more, um, more ready for use, ready for military employment than some of ours. So some of those numbers for the United States are, are weapons that are, that are awaiting retirement, 
they're awaiting, they're, they're, they're not in, in proper uh, military use by design. The United States has designed, decided that we don't, we don't need those numbers. And then, of course, we're still living under the New START Treaty, which caps the number of deployed strategic weapon systems between the United States and Russia, though Russia has said that they're no longer going to be abiding by the New START Treaty um, verification requirements. Can I, can I stop just a second? The, the sure. definition of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty start and where are we and when did we when did the first start treaty uh when was it adopted and where are we on this particular s sequence so we are living under the new start treaty um when when when, when this when the, it's the last standing arms control treaty between the united on nuclear weapons between the united states and russia president obama negotiated the treaty that we're living under now the new start treaty um, when when he negotiated this with the Russians, remember this was at a time if you and you can even look at our nuclear the, the the strategy document that was published by the Obama administration called the Nuclear Posture Review. In it, their assumption was that our that our um, and I'm not quoting them here, but but essentially that Russia was no longer the threat that it was during the Cold War. It's no longer an adversary in that regard. And so though we're going to maintain credible deterrence versus the Russians, that the pri our primary focus for, for nuclear threats was going to be on terrorism um, and um, potential use of, of a nuclear weapon by, by terrorists. But, but the New START Treaty was essentially developed, I mean, it was negotiated under the Obama administration, the, the U.S. Senate um, ratified the treaty and included in the Articles of Ratification certain criteria that the senators wanted to see for a follow-on treaty. One of those criteria was that the United States and Russia deal with um, the theater range nuclear weapons. The New START Treaty only deals with weapons that can be delivered across to each other's territory. Russia has 10 to 1 um, more numerically superior theater range nuclear weapons than what the United States has available. And they are totally outside the bounds and not constrained by treaty, the New START Treaty. Let me so, ask you about theater. What does it mean, for instance, as we look at the Ukraine situation, is that part of a Russia theater rather versus the yes. intercontinental? And then what damage can a nuclear weapon, a theater uh, nuclear weapon, do in a place like Ukraine? Um, so uh, devastating damage. Um, um, obviously enormous loss of life, but there's also something about nuclear weapons beyond sort of their initial destructive capability that puts them in a separate category. And that's just the psychological impact on human beings and the suffering that that um, that attends their employment that, that really makes them a particularly awful kind of, of weapon. And so we're worried about obviously the enormous loss of life, destruction of of the infrastructure that human beings have um, to live. And, and then also, of course, environmental damage, depending on where the Russians might employ a nuclear weapon should they decide to go down that terrible path. There's obviously NATO countries right against adjacent to Ukraine that could also um, uh, be part of the nuclear fallout. So it, it really depends on, on what they would decide to do. Um, but it would it would cross a line that would that of course that nobody has crossed. Um, United States is the only country that has employed these um, in war with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So for for Russia to to think that they could do this in order to convince the United States and NATO to no longer continue supporting Ukraine would be a a, a, a very terrible um, moment in 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 world history. But they could do some. But, but yes, the short answer is that that would be a theater range nuclear weapon, something that they think could have military purposes but would not rise to the level of necessarily eliciting an overwhelming response from the united states i saw a list and i again confirm this or not that there are six nations hosting nuclear weapons italy 35 turkey 20 belgium 15 germany 15 and the netherlands 15. what does that mean so um so i uh I'll, I'll stay away from any any sort of um, uh, specific numbers or or what what they all might be doing, um, and just say that the United States uh, has allies that contribute to to NATO to the NATO architecture for for nuclear weapons. So the United States remains the backbone the backbone 
of, of Article 5. Of course, Article 5 in the NATO Treaty, what we're talking about is that if, if one country is attacked, that, that they can trigger Article 5 and the rest of the NATO alliance will come to their defense. But, but underneath all of that, why you want fin why Finland and Sweden would suddenly decide that they really do want to become members of NATO once Russia invades Ukraine is because they want the full confidence of, of American nuclear weapons that provide their deterrent, that provide their assurance, their security assurance. And so there, but that, that doesn't mean that these other countries don't uh, contribute to some component, some element of NATO, of the NATO uh, nuclear mission. And so that is something that that can change with time as as the United States and our allies determine is necessary to to maintain a responsive, proportional, credible uh, deterrent in the minds of, of again, as Russia, a lot of this is really dependent on what Russia is doing. If Russia um, thinks that there are um, opportunities where they could get away with popping off a nuclear weapon and that the, and NATO would simply retreat because we don't have the kinds of weapons necessary that we would be willing to use that would provide a proportional response that we believe would end the conflict, Russia might think that they can do that. And so anyway, so all these other countries, they provide different components um, of the of the NATO mission. And, and that can be dynamic as the alliance deems necessary for deterrence. As you know, this town <clears throat> and not just this town, but the, around the world are, are full of think tanks. And you're a part of one called the Hudson Institute. What does the Hudson Institute do and why are you working there? So um, the, the H Hudson really began, um, its founder, one of its founders was the futurist and nuclear strategist Herman Kahn. Of course, Herman, um, uh, was a controversial thinker even at the time during leading up to the Cold War, where he was arguing in something that I think is extremely salient, very important as we think about deterrence today. But he was a trailblazer. So, so broadly speaking, he was a true thinker, a true scholar who, who understood that sometimes in think tanks or in scholarship in American um, consensus, Consensus can have consensus is obviously necessary in a democratic republic. You're trying, you're always trying to find consensus to do the right thing, but it can sometimes create groupthink, and and it can be sort of calcified so that if you have other ideas that come up that are necessary to adapt what we're doing, they might not be welcome and can be rejected. And what Herman Kahn said about deterrence was, we really do have to think about what happens if deterrence fails. If deterrence breaks down, does the United States have the are we prepared to employ a nuclear weapon if deterrence fails um, in, in order to make sure that we don't continue to be on the receiving end of further nuclear weapons? And can the United States um, compel our adversary to, to stop um, attacking in such a way that, that could result in the end of the United States and the American way of life? And, and really by preparing for the failure of deterrence, you bolster the credibility of deterrence. And that's what Herman really provided in a, in a very, very serious way. And so uh, today, Hudson Institute is, is dedicated to providing an, a, a forum for intellectual curiosity and freedom to write and think and look at modern day challenges and really try to come up with solutions that we can put to use and that we can and, and make sure that we're always challenging, that we're not sort of coasting on old consensus but can develop new consensus if we need to. And so I've really enjoyed working at Hudson. Um, they've provided great support for my scholarship and work. When you look at the different think tanks, it often shows a certain, I don't, the word bias doesn't mean anything, but I, uh, you're on a side. And if you look mm -hmm. at your organization, it's run by somebody that used to be in Republican administrations, and there are other Republicans there. Why does somebody give money to Hudson, in your opinion, and what do they want out of it? So, so uh, I, I will say, if there's a side that we take, we you're certainly are all in favor of where, where we definitely agree on is that the that we are all better off when the United States is strong and when the United States remains engaged in international affairs. So we are decidedly non-isolationist, um, and we are we are. Uh, not for a world in which the United States 
He's simply accepts, um, you know, decline, American decline, and sort of is constantly responding to world events rather than seeking to affect them and change them in ways that are good for us. And so I think for the people who would look and see what our scholars are producing, what we're writing, and we, we disagree on all kinds of practical measures. We disagree sometimes on the type of rhetoric that is useful for persuasion to develop consensus. So we, we have a very um, intellectually diverse group of scholars who might write and argue in different ways, but fundamentally, I think we're all pushing in, in the right, in the same direction when it comes to American military strength and also identifying the, the nature of the threats facing the United States, primarily China right now, but China's backing of, of Russia and that developing partnership between those countries along with Iran as well. So I think the people who donate to Hudson, they donate, they're, they're, they're giving, they support the work of serious scholarship and research of people who understand that American economic prosperity, freedom and security rely on a strong and engaged America. Um, very broadly speaking, and so those are those are the people and organizations I think that um, that would that would be supportive of the work that we do. In some of your writings, I saw this sentence talking about the nuclear triad: ceilings in some facilities are literally crumbling. <laughs> what led you to write that or speak it? Uh, so that is, is in particular uh, talking about some of our um, what we what we call our nuclear weapons enterprise. So these are the facilities where where we are maintaining our our warheads um, and all of the design work and work that goes into making sure that those are um, safe, secure, and 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 truly, truly, some of our um, buildings that are necessary and part of the nuclear enterprise need a total overhaul, refurbishment, um, in order to make sure that they are the modern day um, facilities that our scientists deserve, that the country deserves. Um, and I, it's also, aside from just the reality of needing to do this, it also conveys something that um, I think is critically important as we really are entering in a greater consciousness awareness that we are in the beginning of a Cold War with, with the Chinese Communist Party and its and its allies, um, allies not in the sense of treaty allies like the United States has, but deeply connected um, partners that they're cooperating with for shared interests like Russia and, and increasingly Iran. But it conveys that the United States understands that uh, our nuclear weapons enterprise and our entire nuclear deterrent is fundamental to, to our national defense. And we're going to prioritize it. We're going to prize it. And, and that's how we lead as, as the preeminent responsible nuclear power is, is investing in it adequately and properly. 11 aircraft carriers in the <clears throat> United States arsenal. And people are now saying things like with the, with the technology that's available to both China and Russia, they can take out one of these aircraft carriers very quickly. You as an international security strategist, uh, what do you think of 11 aircraft carriers plus the helicopter uh, aircraft carriers takes it all to 20? Do we need all this? And when when does this stop? In other words, I, I'll ramble on, but go ahead and answer the basics. Well, the basics are, first of all, I think it's it's harder to hit an aircraft carrier than some people might think. And so uh, there's a little bit of a uh, um, an unknown. We, we know that the Chinese have been investing in these carrier killers, uh, missiles that are designed in particular to be able to hit American carriers. Obviously, the great symbol of force projection that the United States um, uh, has. And, and really, when you look at, um, it's, it's really interesting, when, when you look at the, the last Taiwan Strait crisis or in, in the 90s, and the United States was able to sail, you know, in, in, in what China now contests and claims as theirs, um, they couldn't even see, they couldn't even sort of have the sensors and space sensors and the ability to be able to, they could throw a big fit about what the United States was doing is sailing in what we call international waters, is international waters. They couldn't do anything about it. Well, China has, China has risen and become wealthier. They've been very quietly investing in the kinds of capabilities specifically to push the United States 
out of what it erroneously claims is its own territory, East South China Sea, getting, you know, trying to get us away from Taiwan. And so that's where you have these carrier killers. Massive, massive investment in missiles in general. 90%, I think it, the number was cited by our former Indo-Pacific Command Commander, 90% of China's missiles would have violated the INF Treaty, this treaty that the United States was in with Russia that took away, prevented either of us from deploying these kinds of ranges of missiles, um, ground launch missiles. Um, the United States pulled out of that treaty because the Russians were cheating on it during the Trump administration. But but, but the, the point is they've been developed, the Chinese have been developing this massive arsenal of weapons specifically to hit Guam, US territory Guam and our carriers in the region. Uh, other basing that the United States has in Japan, et cetera, the Philippines. And so um, the short answer is, you know, our adversaries are always going to try to target what they believe is necessary to coerce us and get us out. And so the, you know, so when will this end? I would say the it'll end when when we get to the end of of uh, of world history. Um, the United States is is always going to have to be looking to respond, defend, build defenses, build advanced capabilities, fine tune our deterrence, come up with credible threats so that our adversary is constantly concluding that they should not go down this path because we do have a response prepared and it is credible and proportional and will make sense and they will they will they will regret having hit one of our carriers should they decide to go that route. And so it's a it's a complex, extremely unsatisfying answer. But unfortunately, it just is the nature of, of international relations and defense planning. As you know, we don't have uh, as much capability as we used to to build ships. We're having trouble recruiting people to go into the military. Uh, you know, all this is becoming very expensive. Are we, how far are we behind? Or if mm -hmm. you look at the rest of the, you know, look at Russia and all that, are they, what kind of shape are they in compared to our, us? So, um, this is the really important question that the country has to grapple with that I think that um, our, our, our political leaders have not done a good enough job, I think, of fully grasping and then articulating to the American people. Um, and that is really since the Cold War, um, both Republicans and Democrats, so it's not a partisan blame anywhere, really, um, and, I, and, I, and I say this based on some of the rhetoric, speeches, but also just in the policy and what happened is that really at the end of the Cold War, rather than, from my perspective, stewarding American preeminence that we inherited after the Cold War, preeminence meaning relative strength militarily and economically, and then continue to invest in that to make sure that we stay far away um, from the Russians and any would-be other power, we really uh, squandered that preeminence by permitting our defense industrial base to, to whittle away to basic to, to I mean, part of it's understandable, we were at peace. And so we didn't need to have this massive ability to produce weapons like we did during the world wars. And then as we built up during Reagan's big buildup uh, during the Cold War. But, uh, but the other big problem that we permitted to happen in addition to allowing this to atrophy our military industrial base was a lot of the critical supplies that we need to build a lot of this are now built in China. And so we we were really stuck if we want to build hypersonic weapons and we want, you know, com, you know, we, we want all these different kinds of materials to be able to build these things. A lot of them are on adversary territory. And so that was really um, a naivety and a belief that if we simply invited China into the, the global um, environment, um, uh, financial system and, and had trade with them, that they would get rich and sort of shed some of their ideological um, Leninism, Marxism, and that they would no longer have the same kind of pose the threat that those very uh, uh, dangerous ideologies pose to to democracy and Republican self government government governance. Um, and so here we are. So we so we don't. So I what I have long argued now, um, really, as as we become more aware of the threat that China poses, is the United States must reinvest in our defense industrial base. We do need another shipyard. Um, to produce the, the the ships that we need, um, we 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 do need to be able. I mean, we've we've seen this from from our support for Ukraine. We need to produce certain weapons at much larger volumes, much more quantities. And this is going to be, you know, to deter a conflict with with China, we're going to need lots more different kinds of missiles, and we need to be able to produce them at scale. And so, um, 
that is going to it's, it's going to be an investment, but it's not it's not strictly going to be a cost because it's going to mean American jobs. It's going to be so I think that this populism we're seeing in the United States, both on the right end of the spectrum and the left, can really be conducive to making these arguments and getting the national support we need because we're talking about bringing back American jobs and getting Americans back to work. Um, in particular in, in manufacturing in some of these science and tech jobs at Navy yards. But but that 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 absolutely must happen if the United States is gonna do what we need to do um, to, to, again, to make sure that this is another American century and not one that has China that surpasses the United States. Any concern that the industries building our weapons are heavily concentrated in four or five companies. Lockheed Martin, 65 billion in revenue, Boeing 66 billion in revenue, Raytheon 67 billion in revenue, General Dynamics 39 billion in revenue. And how is there enough competition? Are there enough facilities um, that uh, keep these costs down because so many of these weapon systems end up costing much more than they promise? Definitely agree on this last point. And a lot of it has to do with the way we buy weapons. We don't buy enough of them. Um, we do not have enough um, it, it takes longer term planning and our acquisition strategy to produce much more weapons to get a better deal for the number of them per item. That's certainly part of the problem. But um, but but I always welcome um, the the uh, opportunity for other countries that are that are coming up with really fascinating ways to leverage modern technology to make our weapon systems more efficient and better. And they we definitely have to have uh, mechanisms in place that they can do that. So these big companies don't simply have monopoly and keep some of these smaller companies out. The, I mean, the, the other thing that I've been concerned about is just, just how slow the United States government um, operates and works with these, with these companies, especially when you can compare it to totally private industry who, that isn't just simply dependent on what the government is buying. You look at Elon Musk's and Starlink and his ability to, to deploy um, and populate uh, uh, low Earth orbit with these with these smaller satellites at, at a cost significantly cheaper than what the U.S. government pays to launch satellites. And so there's also something going on there that we simply we don't have the time to to go as slow as we're going um, and to pay what we're paying given the national imperative. And so I think there's a lot we can learn um, to 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 leverage a lot some of these commercial um, uh, advances in technology um, for, for the purposes of our national defense. La last question. What's, wh why would um, Putin not just want to drop all the bombs in the world on anybody if he's willing to sit there in Russia and kill Ukraine citizens very close to him by just civilians? Why wouldn't he just pull the plug and, I mean, push the button for worldwide destruction? And what, and because Vladimir Putin uh, loves his own power and survival. And um, there are Putinologists who, who, can under, who can explain this in a way that I think is more convincing and compelling with more information than what I can provide in this moment. But, but countries will, and regimes will, will always can calculate and consider based on the things that that they value, and and for now, you know what Putin values is his, um, is his legacy, his own uh, power, and and so that's that's what he's that's what he's uh, considering. It's very interesting. It, it's, I, I think it's very observant your point though about how he is willing to commit these atrocities. He does not have the same concern for uh, human life for the for not just Ukrainian life for Russian life. I mean, he's throwing these untrained, undisciplined Russian soldiers, many of them from prisons, really who do not have the training, um, keeping them in unmarked graves. A lot of their family doesn't even know what happened to them. Truly um, immoral and disgusting behavior on the part of, of Putin and, and the people around him. And we have to take that into consideration when we think about this, the, 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 the strategic culture of the Russian military and the last point I would just say for the Ameri you know, for Americans listening to this is the United States still to our great credit, and this is how we maintain support from our allies in the West as well, is that we do not target civilians as such, 
even in our nuclear strategy. We do seek to make sure that we are minimizing, even as we threaten um, uh, for deterrent purposes. And that is not only um, compatible with how we think about the laws of war, but it also increases the credibility of our threats and assurances to our allies. Very different strategic culture in how the United States thinks about its nuclear weapons. Rebecca Heinrichs, expert on international security issues and a soon to be a doctor of uh, philosophy or doctor. What, what would the actual PhD be in? It, it, it's a doctorate in defense and strategic studies. Yes. At Hudson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.